So basically, I guess tonight is evening number three of three, where we're in Matthew. And, um, you know, Matthew's been really good to us. Um, he, uh, you know, he, he gives us an eye <clears throat> on the gospel uh, in conjunction with the other three gospels that give us a uh, kind of a nice full picture uh, of Jesus. And um, we've talked already talked about uh, Jesus as the, the rebel king. And I thought tonight would be kind of neat to come back to that in a way. And not talk about the king necessarily specifically, but talk about his kingdom. Um, now, if you, you may remember that we talked previously about the kingdom. And we noticed that Matthew calls the kingdom of God, he calls it the kingdom of heaven. Now you'll see the phrase, the kingdom of God, don't quote me on this specifically, but I think it's about four times in Matthew. But Matthew actually mentions it, I think 51 times in his gospel, in the total. But it's all, the rest of the time it's called the kingdom of heaven. And uh, again, we want to remember that the reason he does that is uh, it's just a, it's just a nice way. It's one of the many ways that the people of God honored God, God by not speaking His name so much. Um, so it's, this is just kind of a nice way. Uh, like when, like we say we're going to go to the restroom. Well, we're not going there to rest, but we're speaking around it. It's it's called circumlocution, and it's called speaking around an issue, and you're you're still talking about it. So I, the reason I wanted to mention that again is because Matthew is he he's not just talking about the kingdom because he thinks it's a, a nice topic. He he has reverence for God, and he's talking about the kingdom a lot because it's important. He believes it's important to God. He sees that it's important to God. He saw it firsthand from being around Jesus for a few years as a disciple. So, I, you know, I wanted to. I, I know these notes are very wordy, and I am going to be reading through them. But I'm not. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask you guys to stay with with me word for word on these. These are more or less my speaking notes, and I just thought I'd print them out for your for your pleasure. How's that? Um, so, ironically, now that I've put us in Matthew for about three weeks, I'd like us to go to Mark. I know, I know. But Mark, um, the reason I want to go to Mark is because if we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, Mark just happens to have a passage in chapter 4. If you happen to have your Bibles, uh, please follow along with me. He happens to have a, pa- a passage that is it's, it's kind of long. I'll be reading for a good five minutes solid. But... Um, he's got a passage about the kingdom in which he talks in parables, in which he speaks in parables. And to me, it just seemed to flow a little bit better than going around and piecemealing parts from Matthew here and a part from there and just shoving it all together. I thought it would it would sound a little better just coming from Mark's perspective. So I'm going to start start us off tonight here in Math or excuse me, Mark four, and I'm in chapter ten. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything else, or excuse me, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and they may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that that is sown in them. And these are the ones, (coughs) excuse me, and these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. 
Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Um, if you happen to be in, in Mark, you'll notice that he actually goes on for uh, he he uh, speaks three more parables um, about the kingdom. But this is Mark just happens to be uh, he he's kind of echoing Matthew's sentiment. Uh, where where Jesus is talking about the kingdom, but have you ever noticed any time that you read it, any anywhere in any of the gospels where Jesus is is talking about the kingdom, he doesn't come right out and say, "Okay, well here's a map. The kingdom is right here." You'll notice, and then there's there's a country to, to the north of it, and there's an ocean over here, and there's this and that. He doesn't actually come right out and somehow describe the kingdom in a way that we would expect. Because remember that Jesus um, comes on the scene, um, uh, you know, uh, excuse me, when, with his ministry, you know, he comes on the scene with, with a precursor, with John the Baptist. And when he comes on the scene, he's, he's almost like... Um, He's almost like a nobody. And after a while, it, you'll notice it takes a while in the Gospels for the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious rulers to, to kind of catch on and go and start asking questions like, who is this guy? Who is this guy? And it, it takes them a while. You'll, you'll, you'll notice that the Pharisees and scribes are, you know, in most of the Gospel accounts aren't there right away. They're not following him around when he's 15 years old when he's 20 years old it's only after he you know attention gets called to him and so my point with the kingdom is that Jesus just just like the kingdom Jesus is coming along and he he is the king that we need but he's not the king we expect or maybe I should say it the other way around he's not the king we expected but he's the king we need. He's the king. And so it is with the kingdom, interestingly enough, is that the kingdom is not something that the Jews were expecting at that time. They were expecting the kingdom of Israel to rise up with political might, with military might, to, to first of all, break the chains of Rome, and then second of all, to just crush Rome. Just to be rid of them. Go away. Go across the sea. And so, in a way, you know, Jesus kind of uh, brings his kingdom along with him uh, in a way that we don't expect. All of a sudden, Jesus is here, and oh, there's this kingdom that's here. So, my, I guess I don't want to spend my time or I don't want us to spend our time together where, where I'm trying to convince you and convince myself exactly on all the details of the kingdom. And I, and I don't want to spell out all the details of the kingdom. Because I can't. I couldn't pretend to. Why? Because Jesus was very poetic about the kingdom. He spoke in parables about the kingdom. He, and you know this it's not science class it's not social studies he doesn't give us facts as it were but he gives us stories about them he doesn't define a word like we can go to the dictionary and look for a definition of it jesus will simply just use the word and allow us the chance to pick up on it in context so again i don't want us to spend our time reading all the parables about the kingdom or all the information that Jesus has to say about the kingdom because honestly I've done that and I'm sure many of you have 
I've uh, I've literally I've got I've got programs that will allow me to pull up each and every verse about the kingdom, and and I I will I will go so far as to say I have done that and have read through all of them in one sitting. I've done it in multiple sittings, big chunks of them here, big chunks of them there. And you know what? I don't know really that much more about the kingdom than I did when I was first a believer and just excited about reading these these accounts of Jesus when I was 16 years old, when I was 18, when I was 19, reading through John for the first time, reading through Matthew for the first time. And when you read it, and when you read through Scripture and we read His Word, with the Holy Spirit there, we pick up on more than if we were to do a scientific study on Scripture or somebody sitting down wanting to prove Scripture wrong. Because what happens when you do that? The Holy Spirit has a different idea. So, I just wanted to kind of kind of clear the air before we go on about that. But let's, let's get into this a little bit. Um, this series is designed to allow us to see Jesus through the lens of Matthew's Gospel account. Um, this week we hear what Jesus has to say about the Kingdom of Heaven. Uh, my first quote there, I, I'm going to go ahead and read that. This is a quote from uh, K.E. Brower. He's a theologian and a biblical studies guy. Here's what he has to say. In the synoptic narratives, meaning Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the three Gospels of the four that are mostly alike, they're called the synoptics, he says, in the synoptic narratives, it is John the Baptist who first announces the imminent arrival of the kingdom. This message is taken up by Jesus at the very beginning of his ministry. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, Jesus says in Mark. From that time onwards, the whole ministry of Jesus, his words as well as his deeds, relate in one way or another, implicitly if not explicitly, to the announcement of the dawning of the kingdom. His deeds manifest the kingdom. His words define it. The result is that the present dawning of the kingdom, the gospel or the good news of the kingdom, as Matthew calls it, serves as a hermeneutical key for understanding the synoptic gospels. Um, again, those three gospels. For example, it explains the character of Jesus' ethical teaching, which may be understood only as the ethics of the kingdom. So basically, what, what Brower is saying, I just love that quote. Thanks for letting me put it in the notes. Um, what Brower is basically saying is that we learn about the kingdom by looking at our king. You know, fortunately, you can learn a lot by the kingdom by looking at our king. And I think that kind of takes the pressure off of us. Because I have, you know, I think maybe we all have, but I've seen series of teachings on the kingdom, you know, uh, an entire CD set by a particular teacher at a particular church or a ministry. This is the, the keys to the kingdom. It's, it's 10 DVDs and it's 59.95. You know, that gets us to thinking, boy, if I order that, I'd know all there is to know about the kingdom. But honestly, in my years of trying to figure things out in Scripture, among them the kingdom of God, the best way I've learned and the way that I felt most secure in is just looking at the king. Follow the king. What does the king have to say? Well, kings, the words of a king are very official. They, they lay down the law, as it were. And that's kind of what Jesus does. You know, he says, he says, you've heard it said before, but I say unto you, you know, Matthew, in, or in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. And he conducts himself, Brower no, notes Jesus' character, Jesus conducts himself in a way that puts his hearers in awe of him. Boy, he doesn't speak like one of our teachers. Wow, I'm amazed. And the, the ethics, the way he carries himself about, um, 
You know, I, constantly people are amazed by him. Not only the people who are on his side or his followers or his, his disciples, but his enemies as well. They're first of all they they they're confused at times, but more often than not, they're just they're simply astounded. And Jesus knows how to shut up a person like nobody's business. A person that needs to be shut up usually, and the way he carries himself about gives us a hint of the kingdom here or when we read another passage it will give us another hint about the kingdom there so I have a couple questions um, I thought it was interesting uh, speaking of the uh, religious leaders his Jesus enemies who set themselves up against him I imagine them saying a kingdom well what's this guy talking about a kingdom for is he a king well, and, and I imagine them also saying, we already have two kings around these parts. Because remember, in Jesus' day, there's Caesar, the king of, you know, he was, they didn't call him, they didn't use the word king, but it's Caesar was king. Uh, and then Israel also has a king. And in that, in that time, it was um, uh, Herod. And one of the Herods, actually. So Israel had a king, but Israel was ruled by another nation called Rome and they had a Caesar which is a king so they they had it up to here with kings they were ruled they were overruled <clears throat> and so along comes this guy who's talking about a kingdom and you know notice that Jesus never comes out and says and calls himself a king and struts around and says uh, you know go do, go do that for me and get me my scepter and bring me my crown because I want to rule over you. But he is a king nonetheless. He proves himself to be a king. Even if he didn't talk about a kingdom, we would recognize his kingship. So Matthew's presentation of Jesus as king in a land with two jealous kings, we already know that Herod's jealous because Herod tried to kill him when he was a kid. Uh, and then also Caesar of Rome, who were keen to quell sedition and rebellion swiftly and powerfully as soon as a king or a ruler especially Caesar caught whiff of any kind of sedition or rebellion oh that that was that's basically asking for death so just as Israel's expectation was for a military and political ruler to rise and lead her to safety and superiority Jesus presented himself as the peaceful and non-political but rightful ruler of God's people. Remember, after Jesus rose and ascended to heaven, the next couple of generations of his disciples endured intense persecution by kings. It, it started in his lifetime, but it really picked up in, in Paul's day and the, in the disciples' day after uh, Jesus' ministry. So, what is this kingdom? It is a kingly rule, a reign, or a sovereignty. The way Jesus talks about the kingdom, remember, he doesn't say it's over here. It's, it's 30 miles to the north, or it's 15 miles to the west. He can, the way he conducts himself is, that, is such that the kingdom is basically wherever he goes. And not only wherever he goes, he, and we'll get into it in a little bit here, but it's basically he tells the disciples it's among you. He doesn't, again, notice it's interesting, he doesn't say, oh, it's, it's within the walls of Jerusalem over there. He says it's among you. Well, where do they go? They go everywhere. So if they were to go outside Jerusalem, where would the kingdom of God be? I would think biblically it's outside the walls of Jerusalem. Oh, and it's also here, and it's also there. Uh, it's also in this room. The kingdom of God is in this room. Why? Because we have a cross here? Because we have uh, hymnals here? No, it's because we're here. Yeah. So since Jesus is the king of you and me, we must have something to do with the kingdom. Jesus declares the kingdom to have arrived. We thus read here and there in the Gospels about the kingdom as something that has come near and that has come to you. 
um, this kingdom is something that is accordingly proclaimed to prospective citizens. There are nine references to that uh, in Matthew alone. Since it is a kingdom of one which, uh, or of which one becomes a citizen, not by natural birth, but by new birth, it is something that needs to be entered. Four times it is pictured as something that is inherited. Interestingly enough, none of those are in Matthew. That's all Paul, by the way. The kingdom of heaven is a secret that is revealed, and it is heralded, heralded as good news, just as the victory and accession of a king who would be heralded. Once a person has entered the kingdom, it is something that they possess, uh, uh, as in the repeated declarations in the Beatitudes of Jesus, that the kingdom is yours or theirs. Remember the Beatitudes? Blessed are so-and-so, for theirs is the kingdom. That's, that's early on in Matthew. Jesus is more or less starting off his, his ministry with talk about the kingdom. Jesus mentions the kingdom many times indirectly by describing those who belong to the kingdom. These people are those uh, baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire, the poor in spirit, and those persecuted for righteousness' sake. Jesus tells those who are anxious anxious that they should set, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Mentioning the seeking of God's righteousness along with the seeking of the kingdom is, I think, quite telling of the nature of those in the kingdom, and therefore the kingdom itself. So again, or, or, and it, you remember that, it, I, I think this is so cool, that when he told in... Um, this is right after the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus told those who are anxious that they should seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So again, he's not, again, Jesus isn't describing the kingdom. Oh, well, let's see, you know, the kingdom began, uh, it, was, uh, it was set up in this year and uh, let's see, the, again, it's 30 miles to the west and you can measure it uh, and it's right next to France or it's right next to uh, Colombia or, you know, he's, he's talking about the kingdom by talking about other things, our anxiousness, for example. I don't know about you, but I get super anxious. I get anxious, so anxious sometimes my heart goes crazy. It literally goes crazy, and I have to take medication for it. But it never does that when I'm meditating on God's Word. I've never had an episode when I'm meditating on God's Word. There's something about the peace. Um, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Although it is certain that there is a future aspect to the kingdom of God, this kingdom definitely has immediacy. Remember uh, when Jesus was talking to... He didn't say a whole lot to the, to the thieves on the crosses next to him when he was being crucified. He didn't say a whole lot. But I'm sure you will recall with me when one thief, a very bold thief, dying on the cross, on his cross, looked over to Jesus and said, Would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? What did Jesus say? Today you will be with me in paradise. That is, the, that is kingdom talk right there. Obviously, there's other examples. That that is a powerful example. Jesus, notice Jesus didn't say, "Well, how are you going to get there?" Because again, it's 30 miles to the east by donkey. It'll take it it'll take you two days by donkey. He didn't talk to him about how he's going to get there. He didn't talk to him about the wheres and why fors of of travel to the kingdom or, well, gee, I don't know. Or, do you have a passport? No, he just said, today you will be with me in paradise. That's kingdom talk. Um, and, you know, I wanted to... I, it occurred to me to mention this after I wrote these notes. Uh, but in Daniel, um, you will recall with me in Daniel, uh, one of his visions, where he has a vision of Jesus, one like a son of man, he describes it. And that title doesn't mean the son of a man. 
the Son of Man, capitalized. Actually, although it talks about man, is actually a divine term. It's, um, it's speaking of one who has great power, immeasurable power, power over the earth, power of the cosmos. And, and it talked about the Son of Man and his kingdom. Well, again, this is the same kingdom that Jesus is talking about. But when Jesus is introducing it to us, when Matthew is noticing, Matthew, I, I don't think Matthew is necessarily thinking, well, you know, this kingdom is, is, uh, is one that's immediately going to rise up physically before our eyes and defeat Rome. But he's noticing something. And he's writing it down. He's writing it down. He's like, man, this guy's saying some stuff. I've got to get this down. So there is a future aspect to the kingdom where, where the kingdom is, um, is basically all there is. Okay? There is no Rome. There is no, there's no other nations or nationalities that, are, uh, that, ha- that, really ha- that really count or have any prominence. It's, it's the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. But where Matthew is concerned... The kingdom of God is basically wherever we are and wherever Jesus is introducing it. So regarding the future aspect to the kingdom, Jesus tells his disciples uh, at the Last Supper that he will not drink with them again until they are together with him in his Father's kingdom. That's where I want to be. You know what? Give me that. Give me that. What do I have to do, Jesus? In order to further teach about the kingdom, Jesus teaches many different aspects about it through a number of parables. Again, we're not going to read through all these parables. We wouldn't have time, but I wanted to mention them. Through these parables, we find that the kingdom is something that many people will not perceive or understand. All those who do perceive it prize the kingdom highly. Above all, the kingdom of heaven is the economy God has chosen to facilitate his activity here on earth doing this among and through those who are called by his name. So he's setting up a kingdom with not only a king, but with citizens. Because a kingdom needs citizens. A kingdom without people or those who serve the king is it really a kingdom at all. I don't know. But God's kingdom certainly is like that. It has citizens. I'll be one of those citizens. Yeah. Everyone in here will. Yeah. I, I, I don't Let's know, do it. I don't, I don't excuse anyone. I excuse everyone. From so, ironically, I just want to close this study of Matthew with a quote from one of Matthew's fellow disciples, John. We're closing a study on Matthew with a quote from John. Sounds strange. The kingdom we belong to is supernatural and not of this world. John reminds us that we are citizens um, of a far and distant place who have the charge uh, from our very king to bring this world, to bring his world into this one. Sorry, there are a couple typos in that last paragraph. I need to quit using dictation software. (laughs) That's what happens when you use that and don't correct it. So he has a kingdom that he's established in a far and distant place He's brought it here. And he said, I want you to be in this kingdom. You're in the world, but you're in this kingdom in the world. So in John 18:36, Jesus says, Jesus answers, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting. That I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. I think kingdom talk is is best done here and there. Um, it's not something it's not something that's best talked about for hours on end in a study or an hour long sermon or whatever. But I did want to mention it because I wanted us to I wanted to remind myself, but I wanted to share this with you. To 
for you to remind yourselves when when you're reading through Scripture, when we're reading through Scripture, even if we come upon Scripture here in church, and Pastor Hannah is, you know, he's teaching on something and then it's talking about the kingdom, you know, we can perk our ears and go, hey, that means me. Because it's, it's our kingdom too, in the sense in the sense that we share, uh, in in the as co citizens in this kingdomhood. It means that not only do you, do we have a king, but it means that we conduct ourselves in a certain way. Um, you know, you notice when you go to different countries, you know, you see different, you know, oh boy, they do things differently there. Yeah. I mean, and then you go to this country, boy, they do the same thing but way differently. Wow. Well, you know what? We're in, we're in our we're in our own king. We're in his kingdom, and we do things really differently. We do things differently than the people we work with, or that we go to school with, or whoever. But we've got this we've got this um, this this sort of surrounding knowledge about the kingdom, so that when we come across, uh, for example, like a parable of it, if we're reading about a parable, or Pastor Hannah is talking about. Uh, he he he's going over the kingdom in his teaching. We'll know that that means a lot more than what's being said. Again, because um, a little parable or one parable about the kingdom, or Jesus talking about a king such as Caesar or or uh, uh, Pilate talking to Jesus. That was an interesting talk. Whenever you get. To, uh, 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 Whenever you get scenarios in which there is a ruler and a Christian or or Jesus and they're talking, that's always interesting. That's always going to give us an idea of of how we go about in the kingdom, because Jesus is conducting himself in such a way uh, for us to take notice. He's our example. He's our archetype. So. I just, I guess, I just wanted to finish by saying um, thank you for letting me um, share with you from Matthew. I'm very excited because that's my favorite book in the Bible. Um, but I just want to thank you also for, um, uh, I guess, you know, supporting me and al- allowing me to do it as well. Um, the the fact that I've been uh, just given permission to do this means a lot to me. I'm honored. I'm honored to share the word, and I'm honored to share the word with my brothers and sisters.